Why don't you open up with me in your Bibles this evening to Psalm chapter 14, verse 1. For those of you who don't know me, I've been on staff at Calvary Chapel Vista as a pastor for the last nine years, and am just amazed to not only know the Lord and to be saved from my sins, but to have the privilege of serving Him and standing before you tonight and teaching the Word of God. It's a great honor to be able to do that, especially considering my background. I had been raised in a Christian home as a child, but when we got into about seventh grade or so, uh, my father walked away from the Lord. And me and my two younger brothers, uh, you know, we went to church with mom for about the next year you know, kicking and screaming as we get out the door every Sunday morning because dad was staying home and watching the San Diego Charger games or going surfing. And us three boys would have to go to church with my mom. And we eventually stopped going to church altogether. My mom even walked away from the Lord just a short time later, two or three years later. And the faith that I had as a child slowly eroded into agnosticism. I began to question everything that I had been taught as a child up until junior high I began to question whether we could even believe that God existed uh, that was by about the by about ninth or tenth grade I was already beginning to wonder if the theory of evolution was possibly true and maybe there isn't a God and that became very attractive to me because for the first time in my life I began to be able to think that I might be able to justify living a sinful life Because if there is no God, there's no day of judgment. There's no having to give an account of your sins at the end of your life. And I thought, oh, that sounds pretty good, actually. And so my agnosticism eroded into atheism by my junior year in high school. I actually rejected belief in God. I began to question whether Christianity was true at all. I began to be exposed to the fact that there are lots of other religions out there. And I began to think, how in the world could we even... But Why would anybody believe that the Bible is actually true? What about the Book of Mormon? What about the Koran? What about some of these other books that claim to also be inspired? How can you know that Christianity is actually true? And so altogether, I abandoned the Christian faith and I went on that path for seven years. Never stepping foot in a church began drinking and getting involved in just the sinful things of this world, pursuing a life of fame and riches. As I got involved in rock bands, I wanted to be a rock star. Quickly found out how difficult that is to actually become rich and famous. But my life was going quite well, I thought. At least outwardly, I had a good job, I had a girlfriend. I knew where the parties were. I worked at a surf shop down in Carlsbad, a couple hours south of here. But I was very empty and miserable on the inside, as many of you have tasted of the world and seen that it leaves you empty and wanting. And it was at that time in my life that God brought two or three different Christians into my life at the surf shop that I worked at, who, began, who actually were Christians and who began to question my background. What kind of spiritual beliefs do you have? And I, I don't really have any. Why not? I don't know. I used to go to church. I don't go to church anymore. I don't know if you can believe the Bible is true. Well, they began to actually provide answers and good reasons as to why I should actually reconsider that God exists, that there was actually good evidence that God exists, that there was actually good evidence that the Bible was true. And that was very interesting to me because all along in junior high, up until junior high, I had been raised, I had been going to church, I was taught what to believe, but I was never taught why I should actually believe that those things are true. That's a great danger that exists in the church today, that we would just continually tell people what to believe, our children or our congregations, and yet fail to equip them and show them that there are good reasons, good evidences out there that actually support those beliefs, that actually verify that these beliefs are worthy of believing, that they're actually based and grounded in the truth. Well, I began to, over the the course of the next year or so, begin dialoguing with these Christian guys, and I began to research some of the different evidences that they were mentioning for God's existence and for the trustworthiness of the Bible, and my faith, praise the Lord, was slowly revived. And I came back to the Lord. 
and I went on staff at Calvary, or I, I actually started going to Calvary Chapel Vista because a guy, a surfer guy by the name of Joey Baran went there, and I was, in the, I was a big surfer at the time. And I thought, you know what, maybe that church would be kind of accepting of me. I, I hear that, you know, there's surfers that go there. And so I went to Calvary Chapel Vista and gave my life back to the God who had waited for me for seven years to come to my senses. Eight years later, God actually called me into full-time pastoral ministry and I went on staff at the church and I've been working there for the last nine years. I am amazed that God would show mercy to a former atheist and not only allow him to be a pastor, but allow him now to travel around the United States and teach congregations of his people on evidence for God's existence. And that's the topic we're going to take up this evening. I want to talk to you about evidence for the existence of God. I'm going to share with you some of the reasons why I believe that God actually exists. If somebody were to ask you, why do you believe in God? Or what evidence do you have that He actually exists? Would you be prepared to answer them? Unfortunately, many Christians are not. They know that God exists. They've seen Him radically change their lives. And they have a, a great hunch that God really does exist. But we need to, as God's people, as His ambassadors, we need to be able to explain to a person why we actually believe that God exists. What evidence there is out there in support of his existence. Are there good reasons to believe that God exists? I believe there are. This evening, I want to share with you four reasons I believe God exists. Four reasons I believe God exists. Now, I'd encourage you to take notes this evening if you're prone to do so. But I also want to share with you my website. Because you can actually log on to my website this week. It's alwaysbeready.com. www.alwaysbeready.com. And you can actually hit existence of God on the left-hand side of the screen and pull up basically an entire transcript of what I'm about to share with you this evening. That will make your note-taking efforts this evening slightly easier. You'll know that if you miss something, hey, I can go on the internet and print this whole thing out. That way we can cover a little bit more ground here this evening. Alwaysbeready.com. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 tells us to always be ready. That's why we named the website Always Be Ready. We're to always be ready to give an answer or a defense. We're, we're to always be ready to give reasons to people who ask us about the hope that we have. And so this evening, my prayer for you is that your faith would be strengthened. If you're here and you already believe that God exists... I pray that you leave here more fully convinced that God exists, lest you ever be pulled astray okay, or begin to doubt. I pray that tonight's study would sink deep down into your heart and mind, that your faith might be fortified against those doubts or those questions that we're all prone to be plagued with at times. Secondly, I pray that you would be equipped not only to have your faith strengthened, but my prayer is that you would leave here better equipped to share the kinds of things we're going to talk about tonight with unbelievers. Church is not, of course, just about getting together for some huddle. You know, where we all just pat each other on the back and, you know. No, God wants us to get involved in the game. He wants us interacting with unbelievers. He wants us to be able to take some of the things we're going to discuss tonight out to the street, out to our schools, out to our neighborhoods, into those conversations with unbelievers. And then thirdly, if you are here tonight... And you yourself are an atheist. Perhaps your girlfriend kind of insisted or, you know, was prodding you to come tonight. Or maybe your mom or dad made you come tonight. And you're, you consider yourself an atheist or you don't know what you would believe about whether God exists. My prayer is that your skepticism regarding belief in God would be challenged. Not only challenged, but I, my prayer is that God's Holy Spirit would rip apart the walls of doubt that you have erected between you and him because he loves you he desires to have a relationship with you and if you'll pay attention tonight and with an open mind listen to the things i'll share with you i think you'll realize that your atheism is what needs to be doubted 
rather than your belief in God. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, we do this evening want to again ask for your blessing upon our study. God, as we take up this important topic, the existence of God, how we pray that your Holy Spirit would do a great work here in our hearts and minds. We pray for those who already know you, Lord, that their faith would be strengthened, that you would reassure them tonight. And Lord, not only that, but that you would better prepare them, that they might leave here better equipped to be an ambassador with answers. Someone who is able to intelligently reason with skeptics and unbelievers and those who have rejected belief in you, God. And Lord, we also pray that you'd be at work in the hearts and minds of those here tonight who don't know you, as well as those who would be watching this on DVD or out on the internet. God, we pray that you would help them to carefully tune in. And that, Lord, tonight would be the night of salvation for them. We pray, God, that you would illuminate their hearts and their minds, that you would help them to realize so clearly tonight that you do exist, that you are alive and well in heaven tonight, that you created the cosmos, you created them You have a plan and a purpose for their life. If they'll acknowledge you, if they'll walk with you. Do a great work in their lives, we do pray tonight. And we ask all these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. An elementary school teacher recently explained to her class of young children that she was an atheist. And she asked her class if they were atheists too. Well, these young, impressionable kids, not really knowing what atheism was, but wanting to be like their teacher, their hands went flying up into the air. There was, however, one exception, I'm told. It was a girl by the name of Lucy. She had decided to not go along with the crowd, and so the teacher asked her why she decided to be different. And Lucy boldly said there in the classroom, well, because I am not an atheist. I'm not an atheist. I'm not, that's why I'm not raising my hand. Well, the teacher asked her, then what are you? What in the world are you? And she said, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Well, the teacher was uh, perturbed her. You could sense the teacher's face growing slightly red. And so she asked Lucy why she was a Christian. Well, why are you a Christian? Well, Lucy said, I was brought up knowing and loving Jesus. My mom is a Christian, my dad is a Christian, and so I am a Christian. Clear enough, right? Well, the teacher angrily said, that's no reason. What if your mom was a moron and your dad was a moron? What would you be then? Lucy paused, thought about it, and said, well, then I'd be an atheist. The Bible says that believing there is no God is absolutely foolish. And I don't say that with any condemnation or pride in my heart at all because I used to be in that same camp. Well-meaning people can buy into atheism because there is a deceiver at work in the world today by the name of Satan who's very crafty. And he's got a hold of the public school system in a great way. And he's able to mislead countless people to actually believe that there is no God. But God says to entertain beliefs that there is no God is absolutely foolish. If you're open there in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 14, notice verse 1. The psalmist writing here, words that were guided by the Holy Spirit. He says this, quote, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. What kind of a person is the person who says there is no God? In God's word, he says, you're a fool. The Bible teaches that the evidence for God's existence is so clear that all men and women will stand before God with no excuse for not having believed in his existence. In fact, the Bible doesn't really even seek to prove that God exists. It just comes out in the very first verse and assumes that you already believe. It says there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning, God 
created the heavens and the earth. It just comes straight out and says it. The evidence for God's existence is self-evident. It's clear enough in God's opinion for all to discern. This is mentioned in the first chapter of Romans in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, again, a, an author of the Bible who is writing words that were guided by the Holy Spirit, he says in verse 20 of Romans chapter 1, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Not obscure or difficult to discern, but no, God's power, His, in, his attributes, His nature have been clearly seen, being understood How? through what has been made so that they, those who have suppressed that truth, those who have run away from God, it says so that they are without excuse. God says in His Word, by examining that which has been made, all persons can come to an understanding, not only that God exists, but they can discern even His attributes, that He's loving, that He's merciful, that He's powerful and these kinds of things. The first reason then that I believe that God exists is, if you're taking notes, number one, the cosmos. I'm going to give you four reasons I believe in God this evening. As I mentioned, all of them will start with the letter C. And that's intentional so that you can perhaps more easily remember these four different reasons. Number one, the cosmos. The word cosmos, of course, just speaks of the universe, all that has been made. This is mentioned again, not only in Romans chapter 1, but in Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. Listen to what the psalmist says. He says, the heavens tell of the glory of God in verse 1. The skies display His marvelous craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make Him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is silent in the skies, yet their message has gone out to all the earth and their words to all the world. The very existence of the cosmos, the very existence of the stars, the galaxies, the moon, the sun, the planets, these things without a word, without preaching, actually tell the world that God exists, that a creator must exist. The very existence of the universe itself, the cosmos testifies to the fact that God exists. Now let's think about this for a minute. There are only three options for the existence of the universe. There are th only three possible options to explain the very existence of the universe. Number one, some have proposed this, that it's just always been. The universe has just always existed. And something that has always existed obviously doesn't need a creator because it's just always been. Some scientists have actually said that that's a possibility. A second option for the existence of the universe is this, that it created itself. It didn't need a creator, but it created itself. It doesn't need a God, it just brought itself into existence. Or there is one other option, a third option, and that is this. The universe was created by something or someone outside of itself, i.e. God. Okay, so those are the three options to explain the very existence of the universe. The first option, that the universe has always been, or in other words, that it's eternal, has been utterly rejected by the scientific community. Why is that? Why has option number one been ruled out? Well, the scientific evidence against an eternal universe has absolutely demolished this theory. So if you're taking notes, cross off number one there on the list. Numerous evidences from the field of astronomy such as the background radiation echo, uh, the second law of thermodynamics, as well as the motion of the galaxies, now overwhelmingly point to the fact that the universe actually began to exist a finite time ago in an event when all the physical space, time, matter, and energy in the universe came into being. Now, we don't have time this evening to discuss all of these different evidences, the motion of the galaxies and the background radiation, 
background radiation echo and these things, but the consensus amongst even atheistic astronomers, the majority of astronomers or scientists out there in the world today believe this, the universe began to exist. The universe began to exist. Even Stephen Hawking, the very popular and immensely respected agnostic astronomer from Cambridge University, agrees. He says, quote, almost everyone believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning. Almost everyone, he says, believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning. That's interesting. That's what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible makes it very clear that the universe actually had a beginning exactly like the scientific community has discovered more than 3,000 years after Moses penned those words. Perhaps they should have read their Bible. Now, because the universe had a beginning, that rules out option number one, that the universe has always been. Guys, that leaves us with only two other options to explain the existence of the universe. Number two, it created itself, or number three, it was created by someone or something outside of itself. Now, let's consider option number two. Option number two, that the universe created itself is almost laughable because it is philosophically impossible that anything could actually create itself. The skeptic says, well, why? Why is, that, why is that so absurd? Well, if it's not so evident to you, we might note that, of course, before the universe existed, it would not have been around to have created itself. Does that make sense? Obviously, a non-existent universe could not have done anything, right? It didn't exist. We all know that nothing cannot do anything. Would you agree with me? Can nothing do something? No. What is nothing? How do you define nothing? Break it in half, right? Nothing is no thing. All right? Nothing cannot see, it can't smell, it can't act, it can't think, let alone create something. Right? Even David Hume, one of the most zealous skeptics of Christianity ever, agreed that nothing cannot do something. In 1754, writing to a friend, he said this, he said, quote, I never asserted so absurd a proposition as that anything might arise without a cause. Or in other words, he's saying, I never asserted so, something so absurd as that something could come from nothing. Nothing cannot produce something. The impossibility of something creating itself, the impossibility of this is in harmony with a basic law of physics called the law of conservation. If you've ever had a physics class, you'll recall this. This law of conservation states this, from nothing comes nothing. It took scientists a long time to figure that out. They finally got it down on paper. Hey, you know what? From nothing comes nothing. There, this is an irrefutable law of physics. You know why? Well, there's never been a single observed instance in the history of mankind in which this law has been violated. Okay? This law is written in stone. It's never been violated. From nothing comes nothing. So... There's three options for the existence of the universe. Number one, it has always been. Number two, it created itself. Or number three, it was created by something or someone outside of itself. Option one and two can be thrown out on scientific and philosophical grounds. That leaves us with one option. Option number three, that someone or something outside of the universe, i.e. God, created the universe. That, to me, is the only reasonable option. Now, let's imagine that I'm holding up a painting here this evening. Let me ask you a question in light of that. When you see a painting, there's a painting, I'm holding it up. What 
proof do you need to establish the fact that a painter exists? The answer is nothing besides the painting itself. Nothing besides the painting itself. The painting itself is absolute proof that there was a painter. You do not need to see the painter to believe that he or she exists. The painting is all the evidence that you need. The painting would not be there if the painter did not exist. And so it is with the universe. The existence of the universe itself proves absolutely that there is a creator. Now, I've shared that kind of simple reasoning and logic with people, with atheists and skeptics and agnostics on planes when I've traveled um, and just, you know, in different opportunities that, the God, that God has given me, along with that, you know, simple painting analogy. I always like to share that as well. And you know what I find atheists commonly saying when I lay out that whole idea of, you know, there's only three options for the existence of the universe, and then I walk them through option one. I tell them how that's been ruled out by the scientific community. I talk to them about option number two, how that's philosophically absurd and impossible the universe created itself. And then I talk to them about option three, how that's the only reasonable option then I share that painting analogy you know what they commonly say after that first off their jaw is usually dropped about two inches they're very intent looking into me and this is what they say they say typically I never thought about it that way I've never thought about it that way no one's ever shared it with me in that manner and you see the lights come on do they become a Christian do I say the sinner's prayer with them no But you know what? Walls start to crumble. And we're helping by sharing good reasoning. Sharing the truth very logically in a very simple fashion. We're helping to remove obstacles that have kept these people back from faith in God. So I encourage you to go back over this material and get it off my website if you need to so that you can actually take it out into the street and watch God use you next time you have a conversation with an atheist. I believe that it takes far more faith to be an atheist than to believe in God. Atheists believe that everything that exists, the entire universe, came from nothing and by nothing. Guys, that takes a lot of faith. I I don't have that kind of faith. I can't believe that. That the universe just sprang into existence from nothing and by nothing? That's absurd. All right. So, evidence number one for the existence of God. The first reason I believe God exists is the cosmos. Number two, if you're taking notes, is the complexity of life. The complexity of life. Imagine that you have been shipwrecked on an island somewhere in the South Pacific. You and your wife were on a nice vacation. You thought you would head down to Tahiti, avoid the plains. You went on this nice trip on a boat headed down to Tahiti. Well, about halfway there, a huge storm hits. Your ship is wrecked and blown to pieces. Okay? And you find yourself on what appears to be perhaps a deserted island somewhere in the South Pacific. Now, as you walk around the island with one of the other survivors, you begin to wonder if there might be any intelligent life there on the island that may be able to help you get home. Now, as you're walking along the shore, you spot something lying there in the sand. Upon closer examination, you discover what appears to be an arrowhead. You pick this thing up and you're like, that's very interesting. Now, question for you is you hold this thing that appears to be an arrowhead in your hand. After this discovery, what do you think the chances are that human life might exist on the island? Pretty good? Might not be the kind of life you want to run into, right? It could be a band of headhunters, but you, you would begin to seriously think. I, I, I think that this arrowhead gives evidence of design. It, that there must be some sort of uh, life here on, the, on this island that uh, you know, designed this thing. We would think the chances are pretty good. Now, much to your surprise, though, as you're pondering this arrowhead and thinking there's probably life there on the island, much to your surprise, the other person who survived the shipwreck with you suggests that, well, perhaps over billions of years, the wind and the waves and the rising and falling of the tides 
and I just happen to form a rock that looks like an arrowhead. Now, you'd look at this person and go, I don't know, man. All right, so you agree to be teachable. Even though you find that hard to believe, you agree to remain open-minded and continue searching on the island. Now, another mile down the beach, you discover what appears to be a canoe anchored up there on the shoreline. Now, I imagine, you'd be convinced that some sort of intelligent life must exist on the island, but just in time to dampen your enthusiasm about possibly getting off this island, your new friend and fellow shipwreck survivor suggests that, well, perhaps millions of years of storms and waves uh, just, you know, shaped a pile of driftwood into what appears to be a well-designed canoe-shaped boat. Finding that statement even harder to believe than the comments on the arrowhead, you agree to continue searching. Well, you walk about a hundred yards down the beach and you encounter what appears to be writing in the sand. And there the letters spell out the simple phrase, miss you. Miss you. M-I-S-S space Y-O-U. You look over at your evolutionist friend only to hear them say, well, let's not get too excited. Perhaps the wind and the waves just formed that sequence of letters. Now, question for you. What would you say to this person that thinks that simple things like arrowheads, canoes, and letters in the sand may have evolved? What would you say to them? A, you know, you're probably right. Please forgive me for believing that intelligent life might exist on this island and, you know, brought these things about. Or would you say, B, what have you been smoking? I'm sure that most of us here would conclude that the arrowhead, the canoe, and the message in the sand were surely designed by some intelligent life form. Why is that? Because design is not hard to recognize. Design is not hard to recognize. Everywhere we look on planet Earth, we find amazingly complex life forms that are thousands of times more complex than arrowheads or canoes. This amazing complexity that permeates all of life is another reason why I believe that an intelligent creator must exist. Now, let's consider for a moment some examples of complex life forms. First, let's consider the human body. The human body. The human body has an amazingly complex nervous system, an amazingly complex cardiovascular system. It has an amazing reproductive capability, an incredibly complex skeletal system, an incredibly complex muscle system, an incredibly complex digestive system, and an amazing ability to heal itself and to fight off diseases. I find it difficult to believe that the human body could have come into existence by some mindless process apart from an incredibly intelligent designer, even given millions of years. The late agnostic astronomer, he's not an agnostic anymore, he died a few years ago. Uh, He believes in God now, I'm sure, but Carl Sagan, this well-known astronomer, he conceded that the brain alone, the human brain alone, is a, quote, machine more wonderful than any devised by humans and that it holds enough information to, quote, fill some 20 million volumes. Your brain can store enough information. If you've ever been to the Library of Congress back east, They have about 20 million books in their massive library. According to Carl Sagan, the amount of information in those books can actually fit inside the human brain. That's the kind of storage capacity that exists right there in the human brain. Is it possible 
Is it possible this, quote, machine more wonderful than any device by humans came into being from nothing and by nothing and then evolved via some, uh, you know, mindless, random series of accidents as evolutionists believe? I have a hard time believing that that is the case. I don't have enough faith to believe that. You could leave the barren side of a mountain exposed to millions of years of wind, rain, the forces of nature, chance, and you know, millions of years of time, and you would never get a Mount Rushmore, let alone a living, breathing human being. Why is that? It takes intelligence. It takes intelligent intervention to create something as simple as Mount Rushmore. Four stone faces with no brains. They can't talk. They can't smell. They can't hear. And we look at Mount Rushmore and go, whoa, someone designed those. We believe that it would take great intelligence to create a robot that operates like a human and we believe that it would take even greater intelligence to create a real human being. No one alive today, that I know of anyways, would believe that the faces of Mount Rushmore came about by millions of years of erosion and wind, rain, and you know, undirected uh, random acts. And yet, atheists believe that real life human beings with 206 bones, 640 muscles, and hearts that beat over 100,000 times a day are the product of a mindless, random series of accidents. I believe that this is the height of foolishness. We can look at Mount Rushmore and say, no way could that evolve. We look at a real living human being and say, that did evolve. That's foolishness. That's why God says in Psalm 14.1, it is the fool who has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, not only is the body as a whole incredibly complex, the individual parts making up the body are highly complex. Consider the human eye with me for a minute. The, of course, the eye is a ball with a lens on one side, a light-sensitive retina made up of rods and cones inside the other. The lens itself has a sturdy protective covering called a cornea and sits over an iris designed to protect the eye from excessive light. The eye contains this fantastic watery substance that is replaced every four hours. Tear glands continuously flush the outside clean. An eyelid sweeps secretions over the cornea to keep it moist. Eyelashes protect it from dust. And extraordinarily fine-tuned muscles surround the eye for precision motility and shape the eye for the function of focus. The eye is far more complex and advanced than the world's greatest autofocus camera that took researchers and developers numerous years and millions of dollars to design and create. In light of that, my question for you is this. Did this amazing piece of machinery, the human eye, did it come together by some mindless process and random series of accidents, atheists actually are able to muster up the faith to say yes to that question. I do not have enough faith to be an atheist. Even one of the most well-known Darwinists of all time had difficulties believing that the eye came into being by blind forces. Who am I talking about? Perhaps you've heard of his name. His name is Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin himself found it hard to accept the notion that the eye could be the product of evolution. In fact, he even conceded that the intricacies of the eye gave him, quote, cold shudders, end quote. In his famous book, The Origin of Species, which launched, really, the theory of evolution, 
upon the world in 1859, even in that book, Charles Darwin said this. He said, quote, to suppose that the eye, with all of its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been... been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. Now, he went on to say that he did believe that that's how the eye did come into existence, but he admits he had a very difficult time believing his own theory was actually true upon dissection of a human eye. Now, not only does the body as a whole and the eye point to an intelligent designer, so does something as small as a living cell inside any living organism, whether it be a plant or your human body. A cell is considered to be the smallest unit of matter alive. The smallest unit of matter alive and measures less than a thousandth of an inch in diameter. With the naked human eye, you can't even see a cell. You have to get out a microscope in order to behold the cell. It's that small. 